Took him two years to do that U-turn. Two years of the royal family are a bunch of racists flying around the world. I was in America through a lot of that period. And they all believed it because it had appeared on Oprah. Then he says, I didn't ever, never meant to say anything about racism. What are you all talking about? It's the beastly media. Well, now Harry and Meghan's lickspittle client journalist Omid Scobie, the man who lied about his age, said he was 33 when, in fact, he was 38, a bit older now, said he never used private jets and then got reminded of an Instagram picture of him the week before he denied that this week, showing him on a private jet. The man who said that I have regular phone calls with Queen Camilla. Regular phone calls. Never had one phone call with Queen Camilla in my entire life. Well, I'd like to, but she doesn't call. Well, Scobie is back with a spiteful, lie-filled new book that's poured fuel on the flames. He says that Meghan wrote private letters to King Charles, naming two royals who she accuses of taking part in those supposedly troubling conversations about Archie's skin colour. Scobie initially said he knew the names but couldn't legally report them. But, of course, he could have done outside of the UK. He could have done it in America if he wanted to, where the book is published. He could have done it anywhere. But he said he never names names, which is another of his lies. And yet overnight, they were sensationally revealed, suddenly, out of nowhere, in the Dutch version of Scobie's book. Journalists had been sent copies and the book was briefly on sale in bookstores before being suddenly withdrawn in a dash by the publishers. Scobie initially said it was a translation error, which didn't really make any sense, because how do you mistranslate names? They're either there or they're not. The publisher now says it wasn't translation, it was simply an error. But how did that error happen? How is there an entire different version appearing in a Dutch edition of this book? The consequence of that error is that millions of people online around the world now know the royals are again being implicated in what I think is a completely baseless claim of inferred racism. There is, again, massive speculation about who the people are who were supposedly making comments about Archie's skin colour, which is incredibly unfair to all the royal family. They've all been tarred with this brush now for years. Well, I'm going to end all this nonsense... Because, frankly, if a book is on the streets in Holland, available to Dutch people, containing names that Omid Scobie, the Lickspittal scribe for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, the man who you may remember, denied they had any, any involvement in the last book. And so did Meghan. Do you remember? No, oh, nothing to do with it. But then, in court, many months after the book was published, under oath, she had to admit she had emailed her aides briefing notes for when they met Scobie. So she was one of his primary sources on that first book. Now again, we're being told she had nothing to do with this. And maybe she didn't. And maybe we should be believing Omis Scobie when he says he did not ever write these names down in any draft of his book. It just somehow popped up in the Dutch version of the book. How? I've written 10 books, I think it is now. I've never had a version of my book pop up in a foreign edition that contained unbelievably damning allegations about two of the most famous people in the world and I had nothing to do with it and didn't know how it got there and nor did anybody else. How does it get there, Omid? Surely you as the author, I mean, you, you must be furious, right? You, you must be demanding. Heads roll. And you want names, don't you, ironically? Omid, about who did this to you? Who besmirched your reputation as an author? I would, Omid. I'd want to know right now. Especially if I was trying to convince the world that I had nothing to do with it myself and I'd never, ever put these names in writing. And maybe some lawyer had come along and told me not to. I mean, that couldn't possibly have happened because you've given us your word. And as I've established so far in this monologue, your word is your bond and should be taken as sacrosanct. Well, I'm going to cut through all this crap. I'm going to tell you the names of the two senior royals who are named in that Dutch version of the book. Because, frankly, if Dutch people wandering into a bookshop can pick it up and see these names, then you, British people here, who actually pay for the British royal family, you're entitled to know too. 
And then we can have a more open debate about this whole Farago, because I don't believe any racist comments were ever made by any of the royal family. And until there is actual evidence of those comments being made, I will never believe it. But now we can start the process of finding out if they ever got uttered, what the context was, and whether there was any racial intent at all. Like I say, I don't believe there was. The royals who are named in this book are King Charles and Catherine, Princess of Wales. You appall me, Piers. Occasionally, I think, no, he's found the light. He's seen the light. He's no longer crashing on about Harry. And then this appalling diatribe we've just had to sit through. You claiming, you lying there, suggesting that you're putting their names out effectively to save the monarchy. You put their names out for clicks. You're no better than Omid Scobie. In fact, you're worse. You call him a little spittle. You're a great big gob of phlegm that's just landed on the royal doormat. I don't know how you slept last night. I struggled to sleep thinking about what you'd done. I really no, can't. Did. And yes, that's I did. A load of I did. No, that's. That, you, All right, stop you the, suggest that. Stop the you know, performative no, crap. No, no, Honestly, I'm not, it's no, performative no, crap. No, let's just hold just on to you. Calm your down. Words. Have no, a civilised conversation. I'm not calm. The idea we've you didn't sleep minutes. over this. You don't even know these people. I was. No, I was properly angry by your hypocrisy. And then What's you the sit hypocrisy? there, please. Because you spend day in, day out, your pro monarchy, the wonderful queen, yeah, wonderful I Charles, am. and then you go and dob Kate. And Charles, right in it when one's at no, I didn't. Oh, no, no, yes, no. you did. Wait a minute. Oh, no. yes, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, yes, you I'll did. I'll tell you who did that. Omid Scobie. Because these names appeared in a draft of his book, which was published in the Netherlands. And they were for under sale the line. To Netherlands. It was tittle people. tattle till yeah. you popped it on a Murdoch platform. Yeah. And now you've just had the gall to suggest You're that on a Murdoch platform right now. I know I am. You got a problem I'm just with that? Correcting the record. You got a problem with that? For the record, that was Piers's. Highly dubious opinion. I've got a problem with you tonight, Piers. A real problem. Why would you have a problem with a mur being on a Murdoch platform because here you, now? Because what you did was you put those names... You're being you paid them, to appear. Yes, I know, but you took yeah. the names... Why are you doing the that? ...the rumour... Why you are you being paid to appear ..and here? you put it on an official platform. Why are you being paid... You turned it from fiction Why to fact... Why have you accepted money from a Murdoch to platform? ..to challenge you about your behaviour and okay. democracy. And, by the way, just the word baseless. So you're How do you know that Meghan's rumours were baseless? How do you know what she accused Where's the royal the family of? Any of it? Where's the evidence that Where? it was baseless? Where? Well, obviously, it's very difficult they when the two accusers are the chief witnesses. They couldn't even decide on Oprah Winfrey what year these supposed conversations had happened or how many there were, right? They couldn't decide what year. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. You really? Didn't take notes and write in your diary really? something happened. Let me get a dickie. I, I just want to come in. You, you mentioned the Oprah interview, and quite frankly, Meghan said that it happened, the conversation happened when she was pregnant. Mm. About 10 minutes later, Harry came into the interview yeah. and said it happened before they were married. Right. So when did it happen? And did it happen? And there's a big question mark. I will take issue with you naming yesterday, and I made that point this morning. Um, you are a bit of a law unto yourself. It's uh, worse than a law Excuse me, yourself. I didn't interrupt actually, you. Actually, just on the law point, it was entirely lawful what I did. So I did seek legal advice. I got very good, sound legal okay. advice. And actually, there's no question... I didn't take the law unto myself. I actually applied the letter of the law. This information had been published in the Netherlands. Dutch people were free to read it, and I took a view. It was ridiculous. The British people couldn't be aware of this yeah. information. I also said, when I named them, that I didn't believe a word of the racist allegations made against them. I didn't either. I didn't either. I didn't believe anything of that, that, that interview. It was just a diatribe of absolute nonsense, as is the book Endgame. And as you rightly say, Endgame, the only person in Endgame is, is Scobie. Mm. But I did take issue in, in mentioning him last night. Yes, you have, say, a, the, the Brits have a, a right to know. Uh, it's in a Dutch uh, mm. translation. But <laughs> there are those who will say, agree with you, there are those who disagree with you. Well, many of the papers who've held off apparently tonight are going to name them. You gave them no choice. Actually, okay, you've got, always got a choice. Sorry, you always have a choice. Every, everybody's got a choice. Everyone has a choice. Everyone has a choice when it was published in the Netherlands not to repeat the names, right? If they're all going to repeat them tonight in the papers, they were just a day after us, right? And I have a show called Uncensored for a reason. I don't believe in self-censorship. I don't believe when the Dutch people can 
read this information in a book available in bookstores, as some of them had already bought copies, that British people should be denied that information. And the information, by the way, is hugely significant. We've waited two and a half years to find out who these members of the royal family were that Meghan Markle no, and Prince... weird people like you, you with mind, an obsession, Piers, have been waiting, waiting two and a half years. No, no, actually, what the I... entire country has. No, what that's I, just... I, actually, it's a misrepresentation of most of the country. What I actually want to know is he said he had no help from the Sussexes, mm. and yet, on the other hand, he said he saw the letters. Yeah. So how did he see the how? letters? How has he got the information? Exactly. He's not got it from King Charles. No, it's all come from Montecito. Right, Paula. Thank you. Wow. OK, so you're going to be shocked at this, but I actually agree with you that you named, that you identified them yesterday. And let me explain to you why. Because everybody in the royal circle knew who it was. All the royal journalists knew who it was. I've spoken to people who knew who it was. The fact that they've been named didn't come as a surprise to me because it's fairly common knowledge among journalists I actually who don't it was. think many journalists knew about Princess of Wales. I think they thought it was another member of the royal family But you accept with Charles. That, that, that... Well, I was actually knew. surprised... But I was not surprised that, again, it made it even more to me obvious that this is all well, exactly. complete bullcrap. Exactly. And what is your overall assessment of, of where this war is now heading? For that, you need some historical context. Now, look, I used to be a Zionist. I'm a, as you mentioned, I'm a Holocaust survivor. Zionism was very important for me as a salvation of the Jewish people. Until I found out that the state was founded based on the extirpation, the expulsion, and multiple massacres of the local population. And that's not historically controversial. So I'm taking a longer view of this. And I'm saying that the present situation cannot be understood without looking at the historical context. And nor can we move forward if the present occupation and the suppression of the Palestinians continue. So Sharon, your previous guest, talked about the fragile coexistence. There was no coexistence. There was oppression, periodic massacres, um, uh, land occupation um, in the West Bank, the continuous expulsion of the population from their homes. I have visited the occupied territories three times now. The first time, back during the first Intifada peers, I cried every day for two weeks at what I saw. Mm -hmm. So this cannot go on. And I saw the news about the Elgin marbles being returned and how you changed your mind about that. Mm -hmm. Well, how about returning the land that's been stolen from the Palestinians? I'm not talking about the state of Israel. I'm not talking about 1948. I'm talking about since 67 and what's going on right now. So. There's got to be some stop to what's going on, and that's yeah. how I understand it. No, I, this I, is for the I, sake of both Israelis and Palestinians. No, I, I, yes, I, I completely agree with you. This is a, a never-ending cycle. I, I guess, from the Israelis' point of view, what happened on October the 7th was on such a gigantically horrific scale. I do get a sense that Israel is in a collective sense of trauma and that they are determined that Hamas should not be allowed to perpetrate such an, a massacre again. And they are on record, Hamas, just two weeks ago, their spokesman, are saying they would do it again and again and again if they can. So that represents a clear existential threat to the security of people in Israel. So I guess my, my question for you is, what should Israel's response be? Everyone is increasingly concerned about what is going on in Gaza. Clearly, the loss of civilian life is on a, 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 a catastrophic scale. Uh, nobody thinks this is right, but at the same time, I think many would share my view that Israel has a right to defend itself. The question is, how do they do that appropriately, and how do they get rid of Hamas, if indeed you think they should get rid of Hamas? Well, you're raising many questions and many fair questions. Now, look, I live in Canada, where this country was founded on the suppression and the erasure of the indigenous population and the utter denial of their narrative. And uh, in Canada, for example, there were horrendous residential schools where a few decades ago, if a native child spoke their tribal language, they'd have a pin stuck in their tongue. Now, most Canadians are not aware of that history. Most Israelis 
are not aware of the history of what the Palestinians have suffered. They don't know that in 1948 there were multiple massacres of large numbers of people by Israeli forces. They don't know the history, the subjective experience of the Palestinians. And in the absence of that knowledge, October 7th would just strike them as another horrific anti-Semitic event. I understand the desire for defense and certainly even the desire for revenge, but that's in the absence of knowing what the Palestinian experience has been. And the Western press, and as in all countries where the local population has been displaced, the majority of the population doesn't know the history or the subjective experience. So if you're asking me how to move forward, let's inform ourselves of the actual experience of both sides, not just one side. And just as you had this wonderful Israeli woman, um, Sharon here, who spoke with such humanity and such poignancy, you might have some Palestinians on explaining their experience of what it's like for them to live under occupation. And in the absence of that conversation, there's no moving forward. And that's all I'm asking for. I've had a number of uh, Palestinians, no, including a doctor. I, let me say one more thing, sorry. Yeah. Israel's right to defense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Israel has the right to defend itself. Every country does. But Israel has no right to impose an occupation on people. One, we know we've killed thousands of terrorists because our campaign has been targeting to target the monsters who perpetrated the October 7th. How massacre. do you know they're terrorists? Who we know, how, how do we know they're terrorists? Interest, how do you tell a Hamas terrorist from a Palestinian civilian who's not part of how, Hamas? Hamas is making it very difficult to do that because we know that it's So terrorists. how do you know you've killed thousands their of attacks? them? because we know who we are targeting. We are targeting on the basis of precise intelligence. This isn't an indiscriminate bombardment as many would like to paint it. Hamas knows that we do not target civilians. It seems to know that better than some in the West. That's why, for example, we recently declassified a, an intercepted phone call of Islamic Jihad terrorists talking about transporting an anti-tank missile in a baby's pram, because they know perfectly well that Israel is trying to yeah, target but here's, the terrorists here's my problem. and not the civilians. Okay, but here's my problem with this, is that by your own admission, you don't know how many Hamas terrorists, and I, I categorise people who belong to the Hamas organisation as terrorists, just for, you know, for clarity. But you don't actually know, do you, how many of them you've killed? And I, I by, your own, by, your own, by your own admission uh, just a few uh, moments ago, you said that they make it incredibly difficult for you to work out who is a Hamas terrorist and who is a civilian. That seems to me part of the problem that you have with the optics of this to the wider world is that they're seeing horrible imagery all day long. I mean, it's, it's just the worst thing I've ever seen all over social media. Of, well, the worst thing of, we've ever seen were the atrocities that Hamas no, no, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just saying, I, yeah, I've not seen, thankfully, I've not seen what many journalists have seen, which is the 45-minute film of that, and I understand it's absolutely horrific. And I'm not making any, I'm not making any comparison. Bodies, but I'm not, I, I, I would video. not say anything is worse than that, so for the record. Uh, but the horrible imagery all day long, it is suggesting to people that there are thousands and thousands of thousands of women and a lot of children, maybe as many as five, 6,000 children now, have been killed by these uh, uh, airstrikes and now the ground attack. And I think the problem that you have, and I say this respectfully, the problem you have is that you don't actually know how many Hamas terrorists you're killing. I mean, if you're honest, you don't, do you? Is the sad fact is everyone who has been killed in the Gaza Strip in the last month and a half would still be alive if Hamas had not launched this war with the October 7th massacre and then fought out of densely populated civilian areas that it has done its darndest to prevent people from evacuating in order to get to safety while we try to get them to safety. But I want to say something about the civilian uh, casualties because I think this is important. We know that we've killed thousands of terrorists. We know that Hamas is inflating the numbers. You, you don't actually know and that. we believe... But that's, that's my problem know. with this. You say no, you, say you have, we... but when I push you for the details, you don't have them. And that, that Piers, for me... I that, still that, can't that's the tell problem you that exactly you... how many Israelis were murdered in the October 7th I massacre. I understand that. Because I, we're still and that's horrific. bodies. No, but I agree and with I... you. That is utterly horrific that you still can't determine how many people were killed that day because of the horrors that were perpetrated. You and I are in complete agreement. But nor do you know how many of these Hamas terrorists you're killing. It could be that vast numbers of them, and we think there are around 35,000 perhaps in total, that vast numbers of them either disappeared into the tunnels 
and have been uh, safely there ever since, or simply went south with the million or more uh, Palestinian supposed civilians that went down there. Maybe a lot of them infiltrated th that group and are down in the south. You don't actually know, do you, for sure? Piers, during the Afghanistan war, and I believe your brother, a real military hero, fought in that war, British military spokespeople could not have given you a running commentary in real time about exactly how many Taliban fighters were killed. During the Second World War, and I know your grandfather was a war hero who fought the Japanese to liberate Burma, the British army could not have given a running tally of how many civilians were killed there or how many Japanese were being killed. These are facts that become clear when the fog of war clears. And what I can tell you is that when the fog of war clears, and the numbers become clear about the civilian to combatant ratio mm. inside the Gaza Strip. And you compare that to other counter-terrorism wars fought by Western armies, like the British in Afghanistan, like the British in Iraq, like the British against Islamic State, that ratio is going to prove very firmly the extent to which the Israeli army has gone to try to keep civilians on the other side safe from the consequences of their own, their own leaders' reckless and evil and barbaric attempts to try to keep them in harm's way. Piers, every civilian casualty is a tragedy. Civilian casualties are a feature of every war, and they are a feature of this war that Hamas began and that Hamas is that forcing is true, us to... But the